Okay, so um, thanks everybody for um, attending um, this Wednesday afternoon um, to the quarterly meningioma support group um, for patients hosted here at Stanford. Um, and um, what, what you know, as those of you that have come to um, these meetings before know that we generally have um, uh, speakers and topics of, uh, of uh, different variety um, over the course of, of the years. Uh, and um, from time to time, um, I like to have a kind of just a presentation of where the current directions in managing uh, meningiomas are going. And um, the, usually these, I try to coincide these um, support group meetings um, with kind of a national meeting um, uh, uh, that focuses on meningioma. And so we, there was a, a, a mini a meningioma um, um, day that was hosted by the Society of Neuro-Oncology. It was uh, just uh, uh, about two weeks ago. Um, and uh, at that meeting, there was kind of an update and presentations uh, that various um, medical centers were working on in terms of meningioma management. And so um, what we'd like to do today is um, uh, provide a kind of a summary overview of, of some of the research that um, uh, different centers are doing um, around the, the U.S. Um, Dr. Amada is my partner um, at Stanford Department of Neurosurgery, and um, she attended the uh, Meningema Day uh, meeting at the Society of Neuro-Oncology. And so I'm going to turn it over to her to uh, give this presentation. And the, the format will be um, uh, we'll provide a presentation, and then we'll go to um, question and answer. And then after that, um, um, we have um, um, V and some of um, the Stanford nurse or nurse practitioners will be happy to facilitate any patient discussion. Um, so uh, Dr. Ahmad, I'm going to turn this over to you. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to spend the next 20, 25 minutes over this. Um, and uh, just so sometimes I'll refer to um, the Society of Neuro-Oncology as SNOW. So please don't uh, get confused uh, from, from that perspective. Um, happy to take questions uh, at the end and um, we'll try to accommodate as many of the questions as possible. Okay, so just the meningioma day itself, um, uh, they talked about three main things. And I took the, um, Dr. Chang and I discussed about the key main uh, aspects of meningioma day uh, that we want to talk to you about um, and discuss with you. So we went over um, the current standard of care for meningiomas. There were tumor boards, which is basically, uh, which occur in every institution, every hospital, which comprises of neuro-oncologists, radiation oncologists, and neurosurgeons that discuss um, the individual and um, the, the brain tumors that, that they have. We also, on that day, there were discussions on the various uh, management options of the different types of meningiomas. And, um, there was also a discussion about the biological and molecular advances in meningiomas. And one of the things that we'll briefly discuss today is um, the role of microRNAs and, and, and liquid biopsies, which is basically taking a blood sample to detect and even possibly prognosticate how brain tumors will behave. And then there were also clinical practice updates um, from that perspective. Um, one of the things I will touch upon is the reclassification of um, meningiomas, or not the reclassification, there's a, uh, there's a modification in some of the aspects of how meningiomas are going to be classified. And um, uh, if yourself or if you have family or friends that have a meningioma um, uh, diagnosis and you might be reading reports and path reports, that how that might impact both what you see from the report perspective and also how uh, short-term and long-term care will be translated. Um, so one of the things is this slide basically shows how meningiomas vary in their location and their size, and um, just on the basis of that, how they will impact um, uh, treatment strategies. And that's why it's difficult to have like a one size or the same size fits all kind of, um, uh, strategy and hence the need for uh, updates and consensus um, and a standard of care of how meningiomas are um, managed um, nationwide and internationally. Um, 
one of the things is that we will be talking in uh, broad terms, even, even though the meningiomas are so different. And, uh, and that will be, but how are meningiomas, uh, different meningiomas alike? The meningiomas are broadly speaking, benign brain tumors that arise from the covering of the brain. And you might have heard us use a word that they kind of um, um, knuckle down into the brain. So the brain uh, is surrounded by, um, by meninges and these are uh, arising from the coverings of the brain. Um, uh, for those of you who read Raul Dahl, um, there's a short story by Raul Dahl about um, a, a brain surgeon, and he talked about how he fell in love with brain surgery because of the beautiful names of, um, of meninges. Um, there, there are three layers. Uh, there's the Jura, Arachnoid, and Pia, and how that really drew him into, into, uh, into neurosurgery. So um, the menin meningiomas arise from arachnoid um, uh, capsules, which are the middle layer. Um, so again, wherever meninges are located, because the brain and the spinal cord are surrounded by um, uh, meninges, meningiomas can arise from there. And the classifications, and you may hear us and other neurosurgeons, radiation oncologists, and neuro-oncologists refer to them as, you know, they're round or they're, they're thickened, like the on plaque. Uh, we'll also refer to them from, from, si uh, from the site, um, whether they're in the brain, the spine, or what part of the brain itself. And just a little bit about the WHO classification. It's been, that's a World Health Organization classification. And the reason why classifications are so important is that's the same currency of describing um, the aggressiveness of a brain tumor. So when we say one, we generally mean that this is a benign brain tumor. This is a benign meningioma and that it gives us and the patient, their families, and their care team, an idea of what we should, and as all of us in the same boat, should expect in terms of um, uh, treatments and recurrences, and that kind of gives an idea. So WHO classification one is a generally benign tumor. That is the most common tumor, and it's about 70%. Uh, two can also be referred to as atypical, um, and they're about 30% or in and around, and then three are what we call more malignant uh, brain tumors, but they're not, I wouldn't refer to them as cancer uh, because that's a whole different terminology. Um, these are just uh, tumors, with, um, grade twos and grade threes have uh, a higher likelihood of recurrences and that's why they are um, graded higher um, from that perspective. We will be talking a little bit more about WHO classification because that will impact neurosurgery um, and your oncology and radiation oncology and all of your healthcare providers that are involved with meningiomas. So I'll touch upon that in, in a minute. Most brain tumors are sporadic. That means that there is no genetic component um, to them. Uh, as, as in there's no familial component that because one family member has them that it is not um, necessary or the likelihood is extremely low that it will also occur in, uh, in your offspring, but it can be part of syndromes um, such as neurofibromatosis type two. So generally just based on statistics, most brain tumors will be benign grade ones and most of them will be sporadic that there is no familial component from that perspective. Okay, and, um, and also there, there's a classic appearance of, of meningiomas. They tend to light up on, on MR uh, imaging. They, they tend to have a calcification uh, that we see on CAT scans. And um, because they are attached to the covering of the brain, there tends to be like a, like a tail that, that we tend to see. And we refer to that as a dural tail. And in the reports that you may see when you um, log on to My Health Tale, there will be thing, there will be terminology such as dural based masses enhancing avidly that make us think that this is this lesion is more likely to be a, a, a meningioma. So the traditional management options, um, and we tend to give patients and their families, individuals, um, the, the, the treatment options, which are, uh, if these are incidental, asymptomatic, um, 
uh, meningiomas that there will be, and that's what um, Dr. Caldwell here referred to as um, end knife, like no surgery, just um, uh, observation and surveillance at regular intervals every four to six months, every year, um, to kind of get an idea of how they grow. And I'll touch upon that in a second. And then the other options are radiosurgery, um, stereotactic radiosurgery. Stanford is the birthplace of, um, of CyberKnife uh, with um, Professor Adler and then Dr. Dr. Chang, uh, who is now the director and our leader in, in CyberKnife. Um, and, uh, and then the next option is, is surgery. And in surgery, this, this is just a broad way of um, this is a Simpson grading. This gives us again an idea, currency of how we will discuss how much of the meningioma was excised. So the long and the short of it is that a grade one Simpson resection of a meningioma means that most of it macroscopically completely removed. So the recurrence rate will be low and which is um nine percent and these are and the simpson grading has been around for decades and we know that um and this applies primarily to uh grade one um, meningiomas and it also makes uh logical sense that the more the maximum amount of brain tumor you are able to safely excise the likelihood of recurrence will be lowered. So Simpson grading is something that we will, again, is some of the keywords that uh, healthcare providers and families discuss um, when it comes to meningiomas. So um, the aim of surgical treatment, so this is um, Dr. Aaron Cohen Gable's uh, presentation, and he talked about that the first time is the best time, the best chance at cure, that there should be aggressive bone removal in a in a safe um, in a safe way, and then talked about multidisciplinary approaches about neuro-oncologists, radiation oncologists, about your rehab team and your neurosurgeons and the families being being part of part of um, the process. And this is our question: like, how fast does a meningioma generally uh, generally grow? And again, bearing in mind that most meningiomas are grade one, they're benign, they are generally going to be slow growing. So about two thirds, um, according to this meta-analysis of uh, meningiomas have no growth over five years. You could then say to us, and then why? Why do, you, uh, why do we undertake surveillance? Because at the point where we are at, when we see yourselves in, in clinic, we don't have a tissue diagnosis of what type of meningioma that is, whether it's a one, two, or three. And these can, all three of these meningiomas, uh, irrespective of the grading, do look very similar on, sca on scans, on imaging. And so we have to do our due diligence and make sure that there is uh, no growth by just doing interval scans and by seeing um, how the meningioma is responding over time in a temporal fashion, because 40% will grow. And it's difficult to say um, at the get-go where um, what type of meningioma a patient has without kind of following them through. And that's in the case of like asymptomatic, the patient doesn't have any symptoms and if um, uh, and that they're presenting with, with, with a scan. So most meningiomas will not have growth, but there is a large percentage of 40% which will have growth and we do need to monitor it and then talk to uh, individuals and their families about uh, options such as CyberKnife and, and or surgery or surgery followed by a uh, cyber knife. Okay, so, right. So now we're gonna, I'm gonna take off my hat as a surgeon and we're gonna talk a little bit about liquid biopsies. And this might be something that you will read in, um, read on Twitter or hear about it on the news about doing a blood test to detect um, a, a brain tumor. And to and this liquid biopsies have had more inroads in other brain tumors than meningiomas. Meningiomas are referred to as cold, um, colder um, 
colder brain tumors because they don't spark as much of an immune response. Um, and the long and short of it is that if there's a meningioma in your brain, there will be the release of certain uh, elements, which one of which are uh, microRNAs, which I'll discuss in just a second. And once they are disseminated into the bloodstream or your spinal fluid, they can then be detected by a blood draw or spinal tap. And that can be, detect that can be a detection tool to see whether you have meningiomas, whether you have a meningioma. It can also be a prognostic tool. And now we're getting st uh, studies that show that it can give an indication on the basis of recurrence. So it may be in the future that you get an MR scan post-surgery, a post-cyber knife. And then at intervals, you also get a blood draw to see what your likelihood of recurrence um, of the um, of the meningioma is so it will be um, a diagnostic tool and a predictive slash prognostic tool. It's not here yet, um, as in we're not we don't have it in clinical practice. But it's something that uh, we as a group should be aware of and 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 welcome it. I think that there will be a greater likelihood of using. Um, uh, serum blood samples more than spinal taps, but but let's see, uh, let's go over some of the the evidence and and see how that looks. So, I what we will be using, even though there are lots of different types of um, of identifiers within the blood draw uh, for the liquid biopsies in meningiomas, they're specifically thinking it's going to be microRNAs, which is basically. You've got the DNA within your uh, nucleus, and it it is the DNA translates into the protein structure of your body and of the cells. The microRNAs are the regulators. So everything that we're going to say now in the next couple of slides, there is the whole aim is that the genome, the genetic material, will dictate the outcome of. Um, of the tumor and the type of tumor. So we are seeing various microRNAs that can dictate how aggressive the meningioma will be. And we are seeing that these are, can be detected in serum, which, which can be uh, translated to, there will be specific microRNAs that can be looked at in a blood draw. Um, so they basically trend, are going to dictate which proteins are going to be manufactured um, are going to be manufactured and how the disease will manifest it, uh, will, will manifest. Micrornas have are tumor suppressors and other cancers. They have roles in, in cell death. Um, there are certain key microRNAs which have been identified and have been associated with more invasive and recurrent meningiomas and there can be a prognostic significance to them as well. So there is, from what we learned at and heard and a culmination of so many minds meeting a couple of weeks ago, microRNAs will help us identify the various subtypes of meningiomas going back to the grading and aggressiveness. And it can also be used in the future as an effective diagnostic and prognostic marker to detect disease and to identify if it will um, return and what the overall survival will look like. And your ultimate aim is with that kind of genetic information for more accurate and targeted therapies. Now, this is a quick um, slide that's gonna give an overview in one line of people like decades worth of work um, so that we are all aware as a group of what to expect um, and what to welcome when it comes to meningiomas. So we do know that meningiomas in various parts of the brain are, do have a distinct genetic signature. Um, for example, skull-based tumors. So if you think of the, um, uh, your skull like a box, then at the bottom of that box, uh, the skull-based meningiomas um, are, have a different, each of them have a different genetic signal um, compared to the ones uh, on your convexity. 
the new WHO classification, which we're expecting this summer, is going to utilize a lot of the molecular markers, which have been, which I will discuss in a second, to the grading features. So what that means is that you may have a grade one meningioma, which with certain molecular features added onto it, may make it more likely to recur than a grade one that does not have those features. So there are three or four molecular features that are key to assess here. So the grading is one very important part of it. And then we have to see what is associated with that grading. And the molecular features can better predict outcome because the question that all of us are trying to, the, the individuals, the families and us, is that we want to give as accurate an answer to outcome and um, predict recurrence and try to reduce the risk um, as much as possible. So TERT mutations will be, you, you hear the word TERT mutations, and we know that there's a higher level of recurrence um, if there is a TERT mutation there, even for grade one meningiomas. Um, methylation signatures, again, that's an added component to the genome. Um, and they're again associated with recurrence and they can uh, also favorably predict. So that it's a good predictor of, of behavior of the meningioma. Um, and there's a lot of applicability to methylation and will be used in the WHO guidelines. Copy numbers are basically structural variations of the genome itself. So TERP promoter mutations, methylation, copy number alterations, this will all be brought together in the publication this summer and will help us and yourselves, we can stratify risk and predict outcomes in a much more accurate manner. So one of the examples that I gave earlier on which was like, if there's a patient who has a grade one, which is generally thought of as a benign tumor, but they have more uh, copy alterations, in that case, we're more likely to give them radiation therapy, even though that they're grade one. And then they might be a grade two, which is generally thought to be a little bit more aggressive, but they don't have those high risk copy alterations, then you will, you will not require uh, radiation post-surgery. So the management uh, will, be, uh, will be modified and stratified according to that. And it'll come down to basically copy numbers, genomic translocations and mutations. So it is down to what we're seeing from a genomic perspective. There are some brain tumors whose genomic material is extremely complicated. Um, so I think with um, uh, meningiomas, and that's why we're, um, uh, they were quite optimistic about the stratification will provide a greater level of accuracy. All right, um, an important part of meningioma day was also a discussion by neurosurgeons, radiation oncologists, neuro-oncologists, and our partners um, in nursing and um, rehabilitation, physical therapy and occupational therapy, that we are very aware uh, and uh, empathic to the fact that there is a great impact of um, having the diagnosis of, uh, of meningioma and the sequelae from there. Um, and there are uh, multiple different sort, uh, different types of quality of life questionnaires that, that are undertaken. One of the ones for uh, brain tumors in general is SF36, and that assesses quality of life in, um, in multiple domains. So meningiomas are, are, the, are the black lines here. So you basically need to score a higher number. A higher number is good. And you can see across the board, meningioma patients from physical function to bodily pain, social function, mental health, vitality, um, emotional uh, role limitations, emotionally, general health, they're scoring lower. Um, and that is of concern um, from, from the perspective of the healthcare providers and of course to individuals and, and their families. But this is an objective measure that there is, uh, we're seeing objectively from questionnaires and repeated questionnaires in multiple countries across um, 
across the world and over time with patients that there is a significant effect on multiple aspects of our lives um, uh, of patients and individuals who are diagnosed with um, meningiomas. There are also more self-reported symptoms of anxiety and depression amongst individuals who have a meningioma, as we can see here. And there's also an, a great impact on, uh, on caregivers. And this is, again, we talked about um, uh, this great group, um, which is uh, the Dutch Meningioma Consortium, talked about the long-term effects on families and caregivers. And it's beyond just the patient. There's caregiver burden that's uh, described um, uh, in 35% of cases from social isolation, environmental factors, feelings of disappointment, stress. Um, and also, there is a very strong relationship between patients and caregivers, of course, and that there's impact on, um, on, uh, on, um, on the general well-being of, of both individual and, and their caregivers. And, they, and anxiety and depression is, is really a, a very significant aspect of, from, from, from that perspective. And here they talk about unmet needs. Um, so unmet needs of the meningioma patient in the post-operative phase. Um, the key ones were access to targeted post-operative care, lack of psychosocial supports, lack of information to meningiomas and post-surgical treatment, what to expect, what is safe to do, available resources, what's normal after surgery, all the kind of questions which are exactly what any individual going through um, surgery would, would expect. And it's, it's of concern that these three remain um, unmet needs for, 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 for a significant number of, of patients. So what we all kind of agreed upon is that we have to ensure that the patient and the caregiver are treated as a team in a holistic manner, and especially focus on any areas that contribute and may add to anxiety. It's hard enough having diagnosis of having a meningioma, and then the other unmet needs that add to, to the anxiety. So what can be done? So this is, again, a Scandinavian uh, group that talked about, um, and there are various um, iterations of this in, in, um, in, in the hospitals. And uh, this is generally, I found this to be a really well-made, well-thought-out process. And this is basically, so there's a temporal, right? This is, you've got a scan, you're waiting, then there's going to be a form of intervention. There'll be perioperative care afterwards, rehabilitation. But then ongoing and the parallel, there's a case manager that's providing information to the, to the individuals and their, and their families, overseeing the end and connecting. It's almost like grading all the other care processes that, that are involved and they're standardizing and making sure that the patients are getting um, getting the rehab or the phys physical therapy, or occupational therapy that, that they're required. At the same time, there's routine assessment by um, a network of uh, physiatrists. And we're also talking about neurocognitive assessment. So going back to the SF36, where we looked at the questionnaire to see how are patients uh, coping? How are they doing? Are they doing better, worse, well? Um, with, with the added support that, that will be required. And then patient support groups like, like this, just so essential um, to be able to answer questions and to, to, have, a, to have a voice, um, to uh, be able to articulate and ask questions of, of each other and, and of us and, and our teams. So this, this is being undertaken in a formal way in the Netherlands, and we'll, be, we'll look forward to seeing what their, what their results and, and their outcomes are. So you could say, hey, Dr. Ahmed, that's great. But what are you doing here in Stanford? So we're doing a multiplicity of, um, of, uh, of trials. Um, a multiplicity of projects. One of uh, them is that there are some clinical trials which are in development regarding meningiomas and how to combine um, therapies. We're also, Dr. Chang's been very supportive um, of using artificial intelligence and machine learning to predict meningioma growth and recurrence patterns. We're also really interested in um, uh, 
making sure that there's an expansion of a repository for liquid biopsies for meningiomas. So that's uh, hopefully going to be uh, part and parcel as we are future centric here. Um, and um, also, so I'm involved in all these projects that, that we're listing here. So also reviewing institutional history and, and outcome data of specific sites of petrocleibal meningiomas. And uh, I'm also really interested and looking forward to the classification of CNS tumors uh, with the World Health Organization, which should come out this uh, at some point this summer, like summer's here, so hopefully soon. Um, and then um, you could be like, but how will we know? Well, uh, I'm on Twitter as Neurosurgeon Maliha with SGN there, Dr. Chang's on Instagram, uh, the departmental websites, a uh, great resource as well. And then I added a couple of important associations, which are national associations, which are the American Brain Tumor Association and the National Brain Tumor Society, um, which has a meningioma research one that are doing very important and impactful work. And we're really um, uh, so uh, delighted to, to, to see and uh, see, see what they do and, and how they impact, uh, impact all of us. All right, so that is me, and we'll 